I'm Russ. And I'm Danny. And this is the Memory Makers Podcast. The show focused on helping you create amazing customer experiences and make more memories. Memory Makers Podcast. How's that one? And then I like it. I didn't. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Great. I, we I are ridiculous. <laughs> so we've gone from you singing in different melodies to now you're, you're voicing Scoring. the entire orchestra. I love yeah, it. Yeah, we're just going to score the whole thing. Oh, boy. That's what I need is one more, uh, one more overburdened and overcomplicated project that I put on myself. <laughs> How are you, brother? Good. We are... Uh, we are deep in the IAPA prep season. We were just talking about this before we started recording. Yes. Yeah, it is go flight, as they say in Top Gun. And uh, it's it's such a big buildup and anticipation. And you've got so many of the, you know, you've got the big picture things that you're trying not to lose sight of the forest for the trees and just bouncing back and forth. And so, I mean, we've got the sales team coming in and working on, you know, kind of deep dive product training and reinforcement, looking at, you know, hey, this is what our customers have been telling us. This is what we need to make sure that we're really, you know, doubling down on as far as showing up for them and how we want to do that. It's working with uh, the design teams on the booth and making sure that you've got all the graphic designs and the schnazziness and the razzle dazzle. I mean, it is so many fun moving parts. And then you get to IAP and you're like, holy crap, weren't we just here? Like the entire 300 and, you know, 59 some odd days in between when the last IAPA ended and then there I get into this like portal of twilight zone where it is just okay I am right back where we started and it feels like I was just here yesterday it reminded me of like when we'd work at laser flash and you'd be marshalling in the arena on a closed shift and then the next morning you'd be on an open shift on it and you just hear the music and everything else and you're like oh I did I even go home <laughs> so, yeah you, um, you know I'm going to go ahead and drop this in there because, you know, did you know I worked at Disney World? What? Um, but that same thing would happen with the the cue music or the attraction music you would hear at the attractions in Disney. You yeah. work a really long shift and get up the next morning, come back in. And you're like, oh, there it is again. There yeah, it is man. Again. There yeah. it is again. Yeah. It, well, and part of me then when I try to get like my super thinker philosophical hat on, I'm like, oh, okay, well, like that's the power of, you know, memory input and all of those things and how you can do all of that. And so it's like, there's a good side of that coin for sure. But IAPA with just the, you know, controlled chaos that it is at times, it, it, uh, it you know, it's, I got to ground myself in some of that of like, no, this is great. We're going to get to see all of my favorite people. We're going to, you know, just be going, going, going. And, and that's great for my energy level. And then we get back to the hotel hotel room and it is nobody talk to me for a solid 35 minutes please I just need to unpeople for a little bit and then boom right back in <laughs> you know speaking of IAPA one of the things that people will see a lot of this year as they've seen a lot of in the previous years is VR which is a yeah, perfect baby. segue you like how I connected those dots to today's Man. topic so good it's like the segue of all segues right there so but yes absolutely vr is, is you know just it's top of mind for so many people because you know us charlatans are just pumping it up and and making it exciting and all of that fun stuff and it's something that's just really really groovy and makes a huge impact on the memory side too so i think it's definitely going to be at the top of a lot of people's cues for sure and we've been doing a ton with vr specifically through aama as well and um you're heading up the vr standardization committee and uh and, and doing a ton of great work I, i'm enjoying getting to work with you on that outside of the board activities and stuff that i'm doing with them and uh and y'all have been busy getting after it with some things we have and that's what we want to talk about today so um as part of the education and standardization committees that we have in the aama we put together a survey to send out to operators in the industry to kind of get an understanding from their perspective on vr in the marketplace where it is and where it's going and mm -hmm. so that's what we want to dive into today is the results of that survey and then in the show notes for this particular episode we're going to include the link on the aama website where you can see the full report for yourself and every individual statistic and all that information. Um, and I think this is good food for thought for anyone who already has VR or anyone who's looking to add it for the first time. So mm -hmm. the, the, the first place that I want to start with is 
um, there was a question on there about how many people, um, whether or not you either currently have an, a VR slash AR product or if you're uh, wanting to add one in the very near future. And the, the statistic there was 93% of FEC operators have a VR AR attraction or they're adding one in the near future. Mm. And, you know, what's interesting is, um, and I know you get this question a lot too, a lot of times operators who don't have it yet will ask, well, is VR a fad? Is VR a fad? And they've been asking that for five, six, seven years. And I think the market has proven uh, over time that it definitely is not. This is a, a market trend of something that is um, of deep interest to consumers. And it's something that, uh, you know, the number of VR attractions that are in the marketplace, and we'll talk more about that here in, in a minute, it just shows kind of the growing demand on the consumer side and how much better that technology has come just even in the last three or four years. Mm. And, you know, it used to be a question for a lot of operators. Now, this is not everyone, I'd like to be clear, but for some <laughs> operators and many of them, the question is no longer, should I add VR? The question is more, which attractions should I add and what should my VR mix look like? Because there's so many different kinds of options from small arcade cabinets to full scale free roam pieces and everything in between that you can have a good mix of those types of things. And so I think that really sets the stage for where VR is right now, where it's heading into the future with so many of uh, the, the operators in our industry having that as part of their mix. I would definitely agree, and I think that it's it's then looking at what types of VR are going to lend themselves well to what we're set up to operate, right? Um, not everybody is going to be able to grab the free roam VR bull by the horns and be able to run that smoothly if you don't have the right people and the right just operational experience uh, over X number of years and a really dialed up team. You know, some folks want to dip their toe in the water and have more of that arcade and cabinet style VR, and there's a ton of really groovy ones out there that have been industry gold standards. You look at stuff like Rabbids and how well that's done for, for so many years. Um, and then you look at the advancement of things like Kong and Soar and all of these other new types of pieces, or you look at VR agent that's out there that are some first person shooter type of, of games. And so that's, it's a really important point is what type of VR are we actually going to be in a position to deliver a good experience through how much is, you know, is hands on all, all, you know, is this going to require what's that real kind of cost of ownership on the other side of it beyond the attraction itself. And so the, the, Types of VR that most of the the survey respondents were, uh, came back with, the number one choice was virtual coasters, and so things like that Rabbids or Kong or SpongeBob, um, that is a two seater piece. It's got a you know a lot of typically some really cool um, IP that's attached to it, so it's got some brand recognition that goes along with it. Well, that's a really important piece just to draw eyeballs to it beyond VR of like, oh man, that's SpongeBob. Like how cool! It's such a popular brand. Being able to lean into and use that. At Jurassic Park and you know uh, Walking Dead, all of these other ones that you have that are starting to do and King Kong, these are all big draws that then you also have the manufacturers creating. You know, there's more budget behind those types of projects too, so it can have a higher fidelity experience with it. So those VR coasters um, makes a lot of sense is why we're seeing that those survey responses be that that's the number one because they're typically the you know the easiest, if not one of the easiest to run. They've got good, you know, um, visual curb appeal, so to speak, to draw people and, and experience it. And so after that, you know, once we get past the number one choice of virtual coasters, there's a pretty even split amongst the other types, um, you know, whether that's um, hybrid kind of platforms that are taking up that typical, you know, 20 by 20 plus or minus kind of footprint, you know, that four player approach. Maybe they have some motion and, and stuff into them as well um, and some interactive simulators th and then free roam and is starting to get even a little bit more blurred. It used to be free roam was super big and now you're seeing that scale down appropriately as more developers have had time to match and, and meet the market needs. So it's um, it's it then comes down to some of the, you know, looking at, OK, if we're going to go beyond just the coasters and know that there's going to be a little bit of a um, more hands on approach that some of these other models require, 
what are some of the pain points that folks are seeing across those? Um, so that way then, you know, the intention of this survey is to start to identify where and how we can see uh, and create alignment for what the, the operators that are in the trenches doing these things are. How can we push that back upstream to distributors and manufacturers to make sure that new products that are being developed are hitting on this? Um, so Danny, why don't you give us a little bit of rundown on some of the, the first pain point that, that came back that was, um, not surprising, but also better than expected. <laughs> yeah, so one of the questions on there was a, a lot of different options for operators to choose of what are the biggest pain points for you right now when it comes to wanting to purchase or operate a VR attraction. And they got to choose all the ones that were re um, relevant for them. And so we're gonna go through Russ and I and talk about each of the the, the biggest and um, uh, most chosen options that were on there. And, and the number one thing on there was uh, cost of the equipment and the maintenance and this makes sense any operator that's going to be looking at any adding any type of attraction one of the first questions they're going to be asking is what is my capital expense going to be what is the investment to make this happen and that makes sense regardless of whether it's vr or anything else and there's a second portion of that question that's important to consider is also okay now I know what the investment is, but how much can I charge for the experience? And what is my throughput and capacity? Because those are part of the equation as well. Because there are going to be some games and some attractions that cost a lot more than others for lots of different reasons. And it is important to understand, okay, well, if this, if you know, option A is less expensive and option B is more expensive, but option B has maybe a higher throughput and capacity and a better experience, which allows me to charge more per customer, that investment might make sense. And so it's not just about the price tag itself. It's also about some of the other factors um, that are included in that to really make the overall ROI worth it for your particular investment. And mm -hmm. there's also other things about um, sizing, uh, for square footage as well as the cost of staffing, which is are things we're going to get on in just a second here. But when it comes to the the price point of it and then how much you can charge and what the capacity is, those are really important factors to consider when looking at some of these options. Totally agree. And and to build off of what you had just said of the the cost of staffing and operations being another per, you know big perceived pain point and perceived maybe is not the right word, but uh, that there is sometimes where it is a perception that the the staffing and operations costs are going to be higher than what they are depending on which route that you go down and so i think you know to friends of ours that are operators at the vr rabbit hole out in uh in down in nashville from from down from me um over from you but looking at some of the big takeaways that we even saw at the AAMA annual gala when we had these operational panels and things like that is that it's really not requiring a super in-depth tech driven you know masters in IT kind of person that's going to get this across the finish line what they were seeing and they're they're running a standalone VR piece right so they they are only staffing VR experiences and looking at some of that and what they were sharing with us was that so much of it comes down to having that core good staff employee that can engage with customers and help explain what the experience is and empower them with um, education and alignment and orientation for what these experiences are. Because a lot of people are novices or new to doing VR and it, um, at least, especially in the out of home market, just because it hasn't been around as much, you may get your, your folks that do a lot of in-home stuff with their Oculus or Meta or whatever, but when it comes to actually staffing these pieces and doing it, even arcade elements are going to require a little bit more TLC than what your, you know, big bass wheel is or, or something, you know, that's, that's not a non VR arcade element. However, so many of these things come down to just having muscle memory and familiarity with the product to keep the small things small. And so, you know, when a lot of cases it's a simple reset of a controller or a headset, it's just have you had your staff go through the steps enough times to be able to just navigate those things quickly and be able to get to those points and get it back in and going because when you're first starting out and you've had you know you get this new piece delivered to you you've maybe had a couple of training videos or something that that is there sometimes the, the it comes down to a lot of product exposure and really getting your team comfortable first um, because when you look at fecs or location-based venues in general 
there's very few that are unstaffed, right? So this is not necessarily something that all of a sudden is, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to hire two more people or I'm going to have to have more people on my shift. It's just, it, it's not different from ad, like if you're putting in mini golf, you're going to staff mini golf. If you put in laser tag, you're going to staff laser tag. If you put in a dark ride, you're going to staff it. If you put in a VR piece that's a non-arcade, you know, friendly one, so to speak, or in that bucket, you're going to staff it. And so it's just making sure that your team isn't losing time due to inefficiency or inexperience and getting them a lot of reps early on that really keep then the operational costs lower because we're not having to spend extra time, um, you know, putting that through. So that, that from the people perspective of what some of the pain points are around VR, so much of it just comes down to, Hey, these aren't crock pot attractions, but neither are the vast majority of the things that we're putting under our roof. So we need to tackle it with that same type of an approach where we're not just setting it and forgetting it. And one of the things that we've talked about before when it comes to staffing attractions, and I'll hit on again because I think mm. that's so important. If you're going to purchase a VR attraction that requires a staff member, staff it. Mm -hmm. Because if you put a sign up that says see us at the front counter to play or find an employee to help you out or whatever that is, you will not make enough money, period, the end. Because mm -hmm. what you're telling the customer is, this attraction is not worth our time, so it's not worth yours. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important if you're if you're considering a staffed attraction and you do not have the ability to staff it, don't buy it. Mm -hmm. That's just clearly what I think. And I think you're going to be a lot better off if you can wait until the point that you're ready to put in whatever staffing requirements there are. And what you'll find is that when you have the right product and the right market fit and the right staff who are going to work it, the amount of revenue that you'll get on that far exceeds the labor costs that you're going to put into it. I would definitely agree with it. And, and it's just, but if you're not in a position to do that, then pick the right model that's appropriate for you. Look at those, the, the virtual coasters, look at the different elements that don't require that same level of uh, consistent staffing with it. And then, you know, and, and it may be, okay, are we, are we staffing it directly at, at noon when we open? No, but do we have a flex employee that's offering free games and things like that to get folks on it and at least staying engaged with it as opposed to the, you know, equivalent of an out of order sign? Because that's what they're going to see a little post-it note on there and go, okay, nope, I'm out. So it's just being cognizant of what that perception is from a guest standpoint, um, especially. So uh, I, I totally agree with you. So let's talk a little bit about some of the survey results, Danny, that came to, you know, troubleshooting the tech is, is something that folks find difficult. And there are a variety of reasons that lead into that. Some of it's, you know, controllable for the operator. Sometimes it's, it's outside of their hands just due to the nature of the market. So why don't we dive into that a little bit too? Yeah, so that was the number three item on that list was troubleshooting. And uh, this really comes down to training and getting your team comfortable with any piece that you're going to add, especially mm -hmm. if it's your first one. And even if your very first um, uh, VR attraction is going to be something like a virtual coaster, unstaffed arcade type piece, you still want to get your team comfortable because the way that you're going to go through a, a traditional maintenance and traditional troubleshooting on that versus a different kind of arcade game is going to be slightly different. So it's a matter of getting your staff comfortable with like what that experience is, get them playing it, get them learning how the whole thing works. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned earlier in this um, podcast was getting those reps and the muscle memory to keep the small things small, right? Mm -hmm and know how to be able to, to function through that. Another piece of this is doing the research and picking products that already have um, a good track record in the industry, already have a good track record uh, at various locations um, throughout the market, and being able to talk to those operators who have it and understand, hey, how does this work? How often do you, do you have issues? What kind of issues do you have? And just getting an idea, because that helps you understand what you need to be prepared for, right? Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, any attraction that has this much technology in it, there's going to be some times where you're going to troubleshoot. There are going to be some times when you have errors or things that you need to work through. That's just part of it. This is VR is not a set it and forget it. I just set it up, build it, and they will come and it just makes me money forever and I never have to do anything to it. There's going to be a level of involvement, but when you pick the right product 
that has that good track record and good history and also has um, a team with really good tier one support and what are their support hours and are do they have US based support if you're in the United States and understanding some of those things help you feel a lot more comfortable with that decision knowing hey if I do run into a problem or I do have an issue of this thing operating the way I expect it to. I know I can get on the phone. I know I can get on a chat and email, whatever it is with the support team for the product. And they're going to be able to get me the answer and get me the solution very quickly, get back up and running and roll with it. So mm-hmm. those are some of the important things to consider with troubleshooting. Yeah. And, and especially some of that just comes down to, okay, if we're going to have, have problems, you know, tackling this, is that because it's the product itself or is that something that we also need to put a you know side pin in as far as okay what are we doing with our training and orientation and familiarity and just making sure that we're getting people enough swings at the plate to get their hands dirty with it so to speak that that may be something that you you can look at because that's a never ending continuous improvement type of a, a mindset that we talk about a, quite a bit on this podcast as well and so it's one of the things that knowing that people can be super intimidated by it or they worry about what some of these things can be it's just knowing that hey there are plenty of folks over the last five years that have gone through the guinea pig experiment on early adoption of products and and all of that we've seen a variety of players leave and and not survive covid and other market uh, circumstances like that because they haven't been able to support their existing customers or make it a product that is intuitive enough. So one of the nice things that I'm starting to see in the marketplace in general as well is that after we've had some of that shakeup of the Etch-A-Sketch within the VR, you know, manufacturing side, um, you've got bigger players with bigger resources that have an FEC or a location-based venue mindset. So a lot of the newer pieces that are coming onto the market now are ahead of the learning curve because of uh, the lessons that have been learned over the last five years. So um, the fourth piece here that, that came back as far as pain points around VR was space requirements. Certainly understand this. There's, you know, because there is such a wide variety of it, but space requirements is not something that I feel is even specific to virtual reality alone. You look at things out in our um, arcade world and things like that where everything's getting bigger because it needs to have more appeal. It needs to be able to sit more seats and have increased capacity, do all of this kind of stuff. And it's easy to start chasing that ball as it's bouncing down the hallway. We, we, you know, we do that at times and have to make sure that we're zooming back out, you know, to, to, to ensure that we're not missing, you know, the bigger picture at times. And, one of the things that came away from a number of the gala panels um, that, back in uh, September for AAMA was was that distributors and operators are are looking for smaller footprint pieces while having the big you know um, big draw elements and the visual spectacle that that stuff can do. The vast majority of the market still needs stuff that fits within that, you know, 50 to 80 square foot footprint, not necessarily, you know, the giant cranes or the huge connect fours and things like you need a few of those in your portfolio. But we still need the market to be able to support like a 40, a 70 square foot, you know, kind of piece that can still um, not require a complete re layout of my room and all of that stuff. So. When you look at some of those smaller footprint pieces, that is going to lend itself again more to those coasters and the first person shooters and and explorers and things because it's not one, it's going to, you know, be more arcade friendly. It's not going to require the same staffing and it's not going to require the same amount of space. And so that one is just such a good opportunity for folks to lean into or explore options with um, because it doesn't hit on those same space requirements. The trade off with it is, is that when you do look at some of those hybrid footprints that you know that may be in the 400 to 600 square feet or even a little bit higher is that you are gaining seats at the table so to speak and your throughput and your capacity you can service more and you're charging more because it's a bigger experience so some folks are looking at that as a you know hey do i have room for a 3,000 square foot laser tag no not necessarily in my case we were just talking about this with you know folks at the monster mini golf convention last uh last week when i was there was some places when you've got 15,000 square feet, it's not going to make sense for you to do that based on what you already have in your mix. And so being able to get some of these things allows you to start competing in the marketplace 
against other folks that maybe do have some of those bigger attractions because VR is much more of a novel experience. It has a higher perceived value, so you can charge more for it. Uh, but you're able to do that in a way where I can get the same price point for a laser tag experience or something else on this, but it's taking up a fifth of the space. It just gives me more flexibility to, to look at what my venue is actually going to allow me to do from a VR perspective. So I've been really encouraged over the last six or seven months to start seeing a lot more flexible and scalable footprints of those VR attractions because we know that just asking somebody to have 800 square feet or or more is a challenge at times, especially for operators that are already up and running and, and have, you know, columns and bathrooms and ADA pathways and everything else that we have to make sure that we're taking into account. So, um, as we see more of the coasters and the arcade pieces come into the market, I'm super excited for that because it does alleviate a lot of that space requirement uh, piece. It's also just good to keep in mind that the arcade style VR and those virtual coasters are some of the hardest to do because you do have a, a high fidelity tech piece that's laid into this experience, um, but it has to be the most intuitive as well and the most hands off. And so you're, you really got to have your cake and eat it too in order for that to be a, a solid product. And so that's why some of those pieces are taking longer to hit the marketplace um, and, and do more and more of that just because that is the highest mark where it has to be the smallest it has to be you know really engaging and it has to be the most self-driven and intuitive experience out there and so that just takes time and experimentation for the market to really continue to refine that and start cranking it out at higher volume but we're seeing that uptick which is super exciting the last area that we want to hit on in this podcast was asking operators what are the the areas about vr that you want to see become more standardized mm -hmm. and the number one response in that which was an interesting response for me i wasn't sure um i wasn't expecting this and it was the experience categories and what this means is this is how we define vr and the buckets of the different kinds of attractions that you have we've used terms like vr coasters or vr cabinet units or hybrid attractions motion simulators uh, room scale, free roam. There's all these different terms, right? And the this used to be a lot simpler. Go back <laughs> three, four, five years ago and, and how we would bucket these different attractions and, and the categories that we would refer to. But as more products have hit the market, as more um, innovation has happened and VR is being in, incorporated in new and unique ways, the lines between all these categories are getting blurred and there are new ones popping up. So it can become a little bit difficult to know um, because being able to have those buckets is very helpful because as an operator, you can know, oh, well, if it's in the arcade VR cabinet, then I know it's going to have probably no staffing requirements. It'll probably be a two-player attraction. It'll be roughly the size, maybe mm -hmm. the range of an investment. It just helps us understand. But as this has become more complicated and the lines have blurred over time, one of the things that we at the, the standardization committee, subcommittee of the VR committee at the AAMA are doing are looking at ways, how can we standardize some of this terminology knowing that we have to leave room for this to grow over time and evolve, but trying to make it easier for both the developers and manufacturers, as well as the operators to, to be speaking the same language when it comes to these attractions. And so that's one of the projects that we're working on right now, because we think that'll make everything so much easier and it'll make the industry better if we're all using the same terms to mean the same kinds of things. And so if we step back and we look at all the stuff that we talked about today, about how VR, it, it's not a fad, it's a trend, like there, and it has been for a while because of how much it's grown over time and how many different operators have it in their locations and the quality of the experience. Um, the the mm -hmm. kinds of VR categories that operators are interested in and then understanding their pain points and how you can mitigate those pain points by having the proper research, making sure you, you're prepared, making sure you're training your staff appropriately and setting yourself up for success so that when you add 
an additional VR attraction or you add your first one ever, whatever the case may be, you're set up to be able to create a great customer experience and maximize your ROI for the investment that you're going to make. And that to me seems like a great place to wrap this up. As the reminder, we will go ahead and post in the show notes a link to where you can access the full results of the survey from the AAMA on their website. Groovy. Well, I think that is a, uh, a wonderful place for us to wrap up. And I appreciate uh, uh, you pulling that survey result from the VR committee from AAMA and keep after that work because I think it'll be stuff that helps us all grow and learn from and, and be able to, you know, have a better framework as we continue to, to see what kind of magic we can make with VR in general. So, um We've got more awesome content coming y'all's way uh, with our weekly episodes. We've got interviews and others that are coming out into these. And so we're really excited to not just hear, you know, what we're seeing out there, but directly from operators and industry experts. And so we're, we're just so stoked to have the folks that have, have been joining us and sharing their thoughts and ideas because it's that rising tide that raises all boats. And um, so we just are, are being able to, you know, pleased to be able to bring it to you. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. And always appreciate those five stars, please and thank you. If you've got any ideas for future topics or guests you'd like to see on this, follow us on social media and send us a DM. Big shout out to Mikey Mike on the, working the ones and twos on the Ultranet back there. And thank you again all for joining us and we will see you on the next one. I want to do, I like watch a podcast and these guys are goofy and on it, they'll be like, go fly it. This is Troublemaker One. We'll put a pin in that because that'll be a little distraction rabbit hole for us otherwise. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Go All fly right. it. <laughs>